Disclaimer, this video is definitely going to be a very deep, nerdy, sciencey rabbit hole. And some of my science videos are like, hey, check out this thing that cost me an absurd amount of time and resources. Let's check it out and I'll briefly tell you how it works. This is not that at all. You're coming with me on this entire journey. And in fact, at the time of me saying this, I have no idea if this video will be about a fascinating piece of technology that I made or if it'll be about <laughs> dealing with failure. But the other day I woke up way too early in the morning and for some ungodly reason, laid in bed thinking about those really, really expensive motion amplification systems used to diagnose and predict problems in engineering and machinery. Steve Mould did an excellent video on them. Motion amplification is inarguably very cool technology, but to me, it just doesn't seem like it would need to cost tens of thousands of dollars and require a bunch of proprietary hardware. If you have a smartphone that could record 4K video, that means that you could record nearly 8.3 million pixels in every single frame. That is a lot of data, and all you're really doing for motion amplification is analyzing changes in pixels. And if you could detect something like this, then maybe you could detect other slight vibrations, like sound. A big chunk of this video is gonna be deciphering hidden layers of information inside everyday video files and streams, such as locating an object that's causing unwanted noise, or even getting people's heartbeat and vitals in real time from their webcams. You and I are on this journey together, and there are a lot of exploratory steps, and we're going to try and accomplish all of this as inexpensively as possible. In fact, if you have a smartphone, you could do most of the stuff you'll see in this video with free software. Except for this first segment that'll require a few dozen cheap microphones, a laptop, a Raspberry Pi 5, a global shutter camera module. Acoustic cameras definitely already exist, and they exist in a business-to-business -business market. If you wanted to go out and buy an acoustic imaging device today, the cheapest you could get one, at least from what I could find, is about $5,000, and the resolution is so low that I'm not really sure who it would be useful for. Mid-range acoustic cameras cost between ten dollars and $30,000. Even better acoustic cameras cost close to $100,000, and then the top shelf acoustic cameras are only available for rental with a technician who would be operating them. It's definitely cool stuff, but for that kind of money you could buy an electron microscope or a tiny personal helicopter. Mini DSP is a company out of Hong Kong that sells a whole bunch of special use audio devices relatively cheap. Some are better than others, but it just so happens that they have a 16 channel microphone that streams directly to USB, and it only costs $275. I found an absolute gem that I had no idea existed until I started this project. Ocular is Python framework for acoustic beamforming, which is a very similar step up to what we're trying to accomplish here. What it basically does is analyze multi-channel recordings and then turns them into visualizations where you can locate sound sources and then characterize and identify them. The bad news is that I'm not a very experienced or disciplined software developer, so anybody with a few years of Python experience will probably get farther in a few hours than I did in the last two weeks. There are quite a few projects and experiments in this video that are very accessible, however this one is easily the most technically challenging among them. You do not have to be a coder, but you probably should understand understand how Python works in regards to folder locations and virtual environments. Let me be very clear, if you attempt to get this running without running a virtual environment, you will almost certainly run into some headaches. Ask me how I know this. Another really handy set of free tools that fortunately exist is Spectacular, which uses another library called Bokeh to give you a lot of this stuff a GUI that you could run in your web browser. The not so good news is that a lot of the dependencies only work on various versions of other dependencies. I was able to get this working on my desktop, but not my laptop, both which run Windows, and I was not able to get it working on a Raspberry Pi 5. Ultimately, I was analyzing and recording 16 channels in a microarray via Ocular and Python, and then recording uncompressed 1080p video on the Raspberry Pi. The field of view was a little bit too narrow for my liking, but I did get it working, and the only problem at that point was that it was more of a gimmick than a tool. So I brought it outside, and I immediately realized that I never know which one of my chickens are making noise. Now I do. Speaking of chickens, let's up the ante and find out where the family of hawks is living who are probably planning to eat my chickens.
Now we have the capability of monitoring moving sources of audio, but I'm not clever enough to sort out multiple moving sources in real time. I spent a few days trying to set up some type of AI sound isolator for field recordings. The closest I could find to a commercial product that claimed to be able to do this was Moises AI, who wanted $30 a month and could only handle three simultaneous sounds. No thank you. Ironically, a little bit over a year ago, Moises sponsored a coding challenge for a bunch of people to find a solution to this, which is a pretty creative way to not pay an ML developer a salary. But the good news is that the contestant's source code and model weights are freely available on GitHub, and we could just put a bookmark on this functionality as there's no way in hell I'm going to finish this video if I try to build a real-time audio classification camera. I contemplated using this as an acoustic radar that would automatically shoot the hawk if it came near my chickens, but it turns out that that's a federal crime with a $250,000 fine. So, uh, you better up your Patreon support if you want to see that video. Okay, the driest and most technically boring part of this video is over. And if I subtract things that I didn't need to buy, such as extra parts and incompatible camera modules, this acoustic camera comes in below $400 if you already have a laptop, saving you, I don't know, $29,000 off of buying an existing camera with similar features. Not bad. The subtle differences that your eyes would never notice that exist between frames, pixel to pixel in a video of a stationary scene holds a ton of information. And this wasn't just an epiphany of mine. Fellow YouTuber and musician and science enthusiast Posey made a video titled Motion Extraction that is hands down one of the best YouTube videos I have ever seen in my life. And to be honest, I don't think that I've ever seen a Posey video that wasn't great and worth watching. But this particular one inspired most of the content in this entire segment of the video. And if you've never seen motion extraction. It's short, it's to the point, and it's a work of educational art. There's a link below. Make sure you watch it. And Posey, thank you for the amazing content and music. The concept that Posey came up with in that video is both extremely simple and brilliant. In any video editing software, all you need to do is blend a video file over itself with slight time differences, or freeze one of the layers. The result is an exaggeration of movement. So for example, here's my fence. Now only motion is visible. Here's a tree swing. Here's just the side of my house with motion exaggerated by brightness levels. So this is certainly cool, but is it useful? Well, it turns out that every single time I play a certain frequency in my studio, something up in my acoustic rafters vibrates. So let's just point my phone at the ceiling, record a video, play a bass sweep in the studio, and then use this method of motion extraction to see if we could find the culprit. And it's almost too easy. So let's step out back. Can we see which room is playing the bass sweep? Certainly. Okay, side quest. What information about you or I could be extracted from the slight differences in pixels if you pointed a video camera at us? If I sat totally still, what could you learn from an HD video that you cannot see with your eyes? What if I laid lifelessly on the ground and filmed my arm to an uncompressed raw video file with a 6K camera? With just a little bit of editing in DaVinci Resolve, I could easily watch my own pulse. This means that if we figured out a way to filter out vibrations or oscillations outside of the normal human pulse range using something like processing or Python, we could probably find the pulse of anyone sitting still in front of any modern webcam. And yeah, this is a thing, and I tried it extensively, and it's actually pretty accurate. And finally, big companies can use this to gauge how organically excited their employees are about a PowerPoint presentation. There's nothing fucked up about that at all. But here's something that is really mind-blowing. With more modern and sophisticated algorithms and a little bit more elbow grease, we can subtract larger motion ranges, and it is totally possible to do this with virtually any video footage of someone, whether the camera is sitting still or not. And maybe civilization could finally know if Brad was actually nervous when filming the scene where Samuel Jackson tried his big kahuna burger. In 2014, MIT's Michael Rubinstein wrote a 118-page thesis titled Analysis and Visualization of Temporal Variations in Video, which at its base level is a really smart-sounding way of describing what this entire chapter of the video has already been about. However, Dr. Rubinstein's method of accomplishing this was a lot more complicated than what we've seen in this video because it's using spatial decomposition to find the movements and the edges of the objects that were moving, and then exaggerating it and reconstructing a video file. And I remember seeing this quite a few years ago in some nerdy 
publications and forums and being blown away by the video demonstrations amplifying a baby's breathing or vibrations in machinery. And it turns out that this algorithm is available with the GUI and commercially available software for only $900 a year. Or you could just install an older version of the free MATLAB runtime and run the freely available code yourself via command line. I actually reached out to the company selling the $900 a year commercial software and both email addresses bounced. So yeah, uh, don't spend money on this unless you could verify that the software is still supported. But anyway, after a little bit of learning and troubleshooting and tweaking the MATLAB code, it totally works. Although it's much better at detecting vibrations that are consistently oscillating than ones that are sporadic. And there are two different algorithms, one that looks for an edge difference between frames and one that analyzes color. For example, here's a very creepy looking video of me holding my breath with my arm out. You can see my pulse and blood flow in the subtle color differences under my skin. But does it help you see sound? Sort of, in some instances, but there's a much larger problem here that frankly affects all motion amplification using video rolling shutter. So when the vast majority of digital cameras or smartphones or webcams record video, they're actually scanning horizontally at super fast speeds. And maybe a good way of thinking about it would be like if you were in an elevator and you took off the front door of the elevator and installed window blinds there and only opened up one blind. And as you were quickly going down the floors, you were trying to take in all of the information of every single floor. But for a camera, each one of those floors would be a frame. This is a really stupid metaphor so the point is, if something is moving quickly in the shot that you're getting with the video, it will be picked up inaccurately because different regions of the frame are being captured at different times. For example, let's try this. In the film and videography world, this is called rolling shutter. And it's usually not a big concern unless you're trying to film outside of a car window or something. And so it's not really a big deal in YouTube videos or films. But if you're recording video for data analysis, it's bad news. The good news is that there are global shutter cameras that record all of the video information every single frame. The bad news is that they are not cheap unless you buy a cheap global shutter webcam module and record everything to your laptop in an uncompressed format. It is definitely not pretty looking, but as long as you're not dropping frames, it's pretty damn accurate. Back in COVID times, when nobody could get a haircut, at least that's my excuse for why I look this way here, I made a video about Schwerin imaging, which uses a trick to exaggerate light diffraction to be able to see the atmosphere. In other words, as long as you are not observing photons, and bookmark that for a much more fucking complicated and crazy video in the future, as long as you're not observing those photons, light behaves like a wave that can flow or bend around objects. And long story short, I managed to see and record sound waves, technically making an acoustic camera. The problem is that that camera required a really expensive telescope mirror, lights that could operate in special phases, and the case for the camera was my entire garage. We need a Schlieren camera for the people. Not long after making that video while sitting in front of my giant ass monitor with a bright 4K resolution screen, it dawned on me that I could just create some special patterns that I could set to full screen and use as a backdrop set the aperture high, record video at a frame rate at a prime number, like 59 or 61 frames per second. Then just using some filtering in DaVinci Resolve and holy shit, you can see the butane coming out of a lighter. And the heat coming out of the flame. You can even see the body heat rising from my arm or carbon dioxide leaving a bottle of carbonated water. Here's me being stupid, filling my hand with butane and then making a little fireball. Oh yeah, speaking of heat. Question for you, does sound generate heat? Answer for you. Sound is pressure waves, and pressure waves are energy, so yeah, of course it does. But does it generate enough heat to be detectable? In a useful way, even. I actually had no idea, so I tried. So this is a very slow oscillator, creating a very low note far below what humans can hear. But if we turn it up, we'll notice it moves a bit faster. So now it's like a good subwoofer. But just imagine that this is the packet of information that we're sending to the speaker, which will then have to make pressure waves for all of these clicks as they oscillate faster and faster. And as you notice, it gets busier and busier.
So when we get up into the ultrasound territory, which is higher than humans can hear, there's just a lot more information being passed per unit of time, and therefore it creates more heat. Let's see if that actually checks out with the thermal camera. All right, so we're at 85.9. The subwoofer, even when it's at max capacity, never goes above 80 degrees. Okay, now we know. We definitely can see sound via heat, especially in the higher frequencies. I don't know if that's all that useful to know, but I'm just doing my job, ma'am. I actually tried and experimented with a lot of things in the last month that really got me nowhere. But ultimately, I think that we covered a lot of ground here, and fortunately it was more fun than it was frustrating to make. And if you couldn't tell, this video is not trying to sell you anything. In fact, I suppose it's trying to save you from buying things and encouraging you to explore open source libraries and picking up where I left off. That would be ideal, but it still cost a ton of money for me to make this video, and I can thank my Patreon supporters and members for chipping in and making this video possible. And with that, it is also worth mentioning that I got so lost up my own asshole tinkering and experimenting with this stuff that I missed an entire video in the last month. I usually release a video every two weeks or so, and it's been almost a month. And so thank you for your patience, viewers, and Patreon members. And if you want to join an amazing community with monthly songwriting challenges, unreleased music, field recordings, projects and patches, audio production assets, and a whole lot more, my Patreon is for you, and it's as little as one dollar. Thanks for watching. Keep creating. Bye.